Thank you, worship team. That was awesome. That was incredible. If you could turn with me to uh, 2 Samuel 11. 2 Samuel 11. And as you turn there, um, we went over this uh, story in Sunday school a few weeks back. And when we did uh, this, I knew I was going to preach this coming Sunday, and I was trying to think of, again, what, what God was laying on my heart to speak about. And this is what came to mind. How big is your God? This isn't, I, I want to be careful because this isn't just a sermon on me reading scripture on telling you how big God is, but rather it's a self-reflection on how big you believe God is. See, we oftentimes put God into this box. It's an illustration, the the God box illustration. What we do is we take things that we know about God and we put him in the box. And things that we don't know about God, of course, we leave out. And the things that we don't like about God, we leave out. Creating our own God. And the problem with that is that's not God. That's your God. That, and so you're, you can easily fall into the trap like everyone else where we fall into believing something about God or believing a finite amount of God and we start to believe he's finite. And so that's where this question came in. How big is your God? When I thought about this, I, I, I thought about a um, story down that came to my mind. When I was down in Springfield, Missouri, I I went to Baptist Bible College on the north side of Springfield, and uh, down there, what we did every single day, we would go to class, we would go eat lunch, we would go back to our dorm and change, and about 50 yards from our dorm was the gym, and we wouldn't play basketball every day. It was incredible. Uh, We would go and we'd play, and there was usually about 10 to 15 of us that would go into the gym and we'd play basketball. And if you don't know, I love basketball, hence the tie. Um, I I do. I I love to play it, love to analyze it, love everything about it. And I love competitive basketball. So this day, we're about two months into the semester, and we we have like a group that played regularly. So we knew everybody and, and how each other played. And then one day, we're in the gym and we're about to shoot for teams that is you get to the free throw line one guy shoots if he makes it he goes to the right side the next guy shoots makes it, he goes to the left you alternate till you got two different teams and then whoever's left makes it the last team well we had some new guys come in that wanted to play with us and there was this one guy named chris give you a picture of what he looked like chris had has black hair and he was wearing this sweatband he was wearing two wristbands a shooting sleeve, he had short shorts, tube socks with some old school Converse, and he looked like, he, he looked a joke. And at first I was like, ah, he's being funny. That's, that's good. He brought his friends, his friends thought he was funny. And then he started dribbling a basketball, and the way he was dribbling it, I was like, this guy doesn't know how to play. And if you're like me, and I could be like the bad guy here. If you're like me, I love competitive ball. I love it. And, and so there's a time for playing basketball, like with when you're joking around, or even if there's certain people that are really good and they, they kind of just tone it down for some people that aren't so good. And then there's time for competitive basketball. And that's what I had, and I wanted it, and I wanted to keep it. And so this guy, Chris, comes in, and my dude can't dribble a basketball. He can't shoot a basketball, and uh, his form is all wrong, and I'm, I'm going, please don't be on my team. Please don't be on my team. Please don't be on my team. I won, because if you won, you got to play again. If you lost, you had to sit, and so I've, that's what's going through my head. I want a good basketball team, so sure enough, Chris gets up there, free throw line, bang, bang, and if you ever know Rick Barry, he shot a free throw on your hand. That's what he did swish he went to the other team i was so glad i was like okay he's not on my team i'm I'm good and we start playing 
And you guys might know where the story's headed, but Chris was a Division II basketball player who gave up basketball to be a pastor. And he was playing a church in Indiana, and so he decided to go to BBC. And my, my guy was 6'2", 190 to 200 pounds, and completely wiped the floor with my team. And I'm sitting there going, I wish he was on my team. <laughs> you know, like, that's what I wanted. And, and, but, like, I completely underestimated Chris on his ability to play. And I, and I was so, like, I couldn't believe myself because I was like, I mean, you're pretty good at judge of people in there. And he completely had me fooled. I actually, we're good friends now. I talked to him later, and I told him this story. And he goes, that was the point. I wanted to come in and mess with you guys. And so I was like, ah, you're funny. You know, go, go plant a church, you know. So, but we had a, but I feel like so often we do this in our lives with God. This is, this is the exact same concept. We dress God how we want him to look, and then we underestimate his abilities in our life. We do it all the time. This is normal. It's why we ask the question, how big is your God? Let's read this story that you've probably heard a million times, and we're going to read it again. Stay with me as I read uh, chapter 11, 2 Samuel. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Reba. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Eliam, the, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanliness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. This is soap opera, right? This is dun, dun, dun. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark in Israel and Judah dwell in booths. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next, and David invited him, and he ate in his presence and drank so that he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on, on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it to, by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him, that he may be struck down and die. And as Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there to be valiant men. And the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite also died. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, uh, we ask right now, God, that you would be lifted up. I pray that my words would be your words. I pray that it's your message that speaks to this congregation today. We love you, Father, and we're so grateful for everything you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The first point is uh, God in your problems. God in your problems. Uh, how big is your God in your problems? Something that... Um, comes to mind is we all have them and they're inevitable life happens that's why that's a statement life happens we walk through life we have problems financial problems relationship problems you name it it's there it doesn't always necessarily have to be sin but we have problems and this is where i think we walk into the trap of how big i believe god is will affect how i believe my problems are so if I believe in a big God, I will most likely believe my problems 
are littler. Not little, littler. Problems don't go away when you realize how big God is. Problems don't just vanish when you realize God is omnipotent. They're still there. And I was thinking, what's a typical bad day for us? And I was thinking about it, and I was like, and so I was walking through it. You wake up in the morning, you're happy, right? Because bad days, sometimes, most, most bad days don't start off with you waking up going, I'm going to have a bad day today. Like, you're happy. And most of the time you look back in the morning, you're like, I was so happy this morning. <laughs> like, you get to that point. But I, I, I imagine, like, just real, just even first world problems. Like, you go and you, you're, you're excited for that bowl of cereal. You got Lucky Charms. You bought them the day before. And you're so excited. And those marshmallows. And, and you pour your bowl of cereal. And you go to the fridge. And what's not there? Milk. Or a sliver of milk. Enough to just get your cereal wet. That's not good. And so you right off the bat, you're like, oh, this is an inconvenience. This isn't fair. This isn't right. And you go about your day. You're now getting ready, and your spouse gets up, and, you, and he or she is, is like, um, hey, don't forget to do this today. Uh, you said you were going to do it yesterday. Can you make sure you do it today? You're like, sure, I got it. So you go outside, and what you start to get in your car, your car, your tire's flat, or your car won't start. And you're like, come on. Like, it's just the morning. What's wrong? Like, you get it fixed, and you're on your way to work. You finally get to work, but you're there late. And there's your boss. Your boss is standing at the door waiting for you. And what do they say? Hey, we need to talk. Can you come see me later? They won't tell you what it is right there because they want you to think about what they're going to talk to you about. And so you go the entire work day dwelling on what they're going to talk, what they're going to say. Man, I hope it's not this. Because then you start to think, what have I done wrong? What have I done wrong? Am I, I know I was late, but did I do something wrong yesterday? Did I say, say the wrong thing? Like you go through all of this. You get into there with your boss, and then they start telling you, hey, don't show up late. You know better. And then they're like, hey, by the way, you forgot to do this really important thing yesterday. Don't do that again. Or your job's on the line. So this is, and now it's like, oh, man, your day is starting to pile up. So you go home and you go inside. Maybe you got kids, and, and they start going, Dad, Dad, or Mom, Mom. And they love you. They don't, they don't know about your day, but they're climbing all over you, and all you want is space. You don't get space because you don't get a break, and that's all you want. You want a break. But then your spouse comes to me or you, and says, hey, I need you, by the way, before we go to bed tonight, I need this, 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 I need that done tonight. At this point, you're about ready to blow up. I haven't had a break all day. It started off with no milk. And so, what it leads to is an argument with your spouse. You go to bed angry. Problems. This is life. This is normal. See, in Matthew, uh, there's, there's a passage where Peter and the disciples, uh, Jesus sends them across the sea. And as they're going by, all of a sudden they see what they think is a ghost that's walking on the water beside them. And they're like, who is that? And they, Jesus, if that's you, let us know. Like they're, they're, they're wanting that. And then Peter says this, if that is you, let me come out to you. And so sure enough, Peter, get, Jesus is like, come on. And so Jesus gets out of the boat and he starts walking on the water. Pfft, amazing. He's walking on the water to Jesus. And this is how we start to view our problems. Because in the Bible, it says that the waves started coming and the wind started coming. And all of a sudden, Peter starts seeing his problem more than Jesus. Jesus became an afterthought and Peter was like scared for his life. And what does Jesus do? This is, my, this is one of my favorite parts. He reaches down and he picks him up out of the water. And he says, why are you afraid? Oh, ye of little faith. 
I don't necessarily think that that's him like reprimanding him, but more so, why did you take your eyes off me? Why are you failing to see me as who I am? You started to sink because you thought your problems were bigger than God. And that's where we fall. How big is your God? See, how you view God will affect how you view your problems. Let's keep going. Second point. God in your sin. God in your sin. Let's recap this story really quick. David, who is a king, what does he do? He, in the time that kings go to war, where's David? He's home. He's not going anywhere. So he's at home, and, and everybody else is fighting the war, and he's home, and he's on the rooftop, and who does he see? A beautiful woman, Bathsheba, taking a bath. There's a pun there, I know. Bathsheba is there, and he inquires about her. That's what I find interesting, is he didn't just sin for her, he inquired about her. And so he knew the information before he dove into sin. He knew she was married, and he sought her anyway. And so she comes in, and he lays with her, committing adultery. He was tempted, and then he dove into the temptation sinning so then what he does is he realizes he sinned and then he realizes he's going to get caught that's the thing right we we sin but we don't want to get caught sinning especially if you're habitually sinning especially if you're doing things against the lord on a regular basis making a practice of sinning we don't want that so david realizes that he messed up and i gotta do something about it so instead of going to God and asking for forgiveness, what does he do? He tries to cover it up himself. So what he does is he sends for the husband, Uriah the Hittite. Come on in, Uriah, you'll be my honored guest. And so Uriah comes in, and he has this party. And what I think is interesting is there in the Word, he's making small talk. David's making small talk with Uriah. He's like, how's the war going? <laughs> like, that's a question I want to talk about. Like, like it's a how's the weather thing. And, and so Uriah then comes in, and he goes, go home. But Uriah, being honorable, does not. He actually doesn't even go home. He actually just sleeps outside the Lord's house. That's it. He doesn't, it says he didn't go to his house at all because he was honorable. So David, can you imagine how David's feeling right now? I'm giving you everything. No one else gets this privilege. You get it, and you're not doing what I'm asking you to do. Come on, Uriah. Like, I can just imagine the frustration that is in David because he's not, he's not going to get away with it. Have you ever felt like that? So then David comes up with another plan. I'm going to take away his inhibition. I'm going to take away every, like, I'm going to make him just go complete primal. So I'm going to get him drunk. That's what he does. But guess what Uriah does? The opposite of what David wants him to do. He sleeps outside the Lord's house, does not go to his home. As long as your soul lives, I will not do this. That's what Uriah says. So then, after that, I find it very interesting. David is going to send him back to war with his own death note in his hand. Isn't that scary? That's the point David got to. Is that he's willing to write a letter that says, send Uriah on the front lines. Roll it up. Here, Uriah, take that to your commander. Merry Christmas. I'm just like, that's low. Instead of owning his own sin, David chooses to kill somebody. Could you imagine Uriah at this point? He gives the letter. He won't read it because it's the king's letter to his commander. He's not going to read it. So he goes and he gets assigned to the front lines. Can you imagine the fear 
and the, how scared you'd be when you get up there because he's honorable. He's, he's going to be courageous. He gets up there and his whole line backs off of him when the fighting starts to make sure you ride or dies. To be the only one there and that's what you see. And you have no idea why. This is what sin does. It, it affects not just you, but people. And so often we take our view of God and we're like, God can't handle this. I'll handle it instead. But I'm telling you this. You can't hide sin. You can't. As much as you want to, you can't. It's not hidden. And so when we start to view God as a big God, we realize He can start handling your sin. In two ways. The first way is he confronts it. Let's read this in, in chapter 12. And the Lord Na sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had, a ve had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he bought it up, and it grew up with him and his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guests who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, you are that man. It's one, it's just a crescendo. And it's just like, I got you, David. God's got you. And then this is where it comes in. The Lord confronts him and says, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives and your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and have given and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. What we see here is God is justice. God is justice. He confronts the sin, and he, there's consequences to it. See, that's kind of the part of God when we think of how big he is. That's kind of the part of God we want to throw to the wayside is the justice part of God. See, our culture wants to think God is just this lovey-dovey God. Like, and that's not, he is love. He is love. But that's not all he is. And so here, what we're seeing is David didn't, wasn't contemplating about God being this God when he was sinning. He wasn't realizing that this God is bigger than me and could strike me down at any point for disobeying him. He, he completely threw that to the wind. He thought, I can solve my own sin problem. And that's where he failed. But here's what I love about God. Let's skip down to verse 13. David said to Nathan, this is when David realized what he did. I have sinned against the Lord. We see repentance from David. We see a willingness. He realizes who God is at this point, and he's asking for forgiveness. He's starting to understand that God is God. And I need to quit do, doing this stuff. And then it says, And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Whew. So we see both justice and we see grace and mercy in God here. I don't know if you're sitting there Maybe you are in sin. Maybe, maybe you're just having trouble forgiving yourself for something. 
Or maybe you think God won't forgive you. The story of uh, Peter in that, in that passage in Matthew, something that I love that is done there, is Jesus, when Peter starts falling, it says Jesus reached down and grabbed him. He didn't wait for him to go all the way under. He reached and grabbed him and picked him up and said, why are you so afraid? Have you ever confronted somebody in your life? Uh, or, or been confronted? Or maybe you, you went to somebody asking for forgiveness for something you've done. So you've walked to them and you, you, you realize you did, did something wrong. But you're afraid to go to them and ask for forgiveness because you don't know the reaction that you're going to get. Have you ever been there? I know I have. I Like walking to someone and, and saying, I'm so sorry I did this. Will you forgive me? And then, then they go into, yeah, you shouldn't have done that. How dare you? You don't know what that caused. You don't know how that affected my life. And they go off on you. And you're like, I was just asking for forgiveness. Why are you doing this? I already feel terrible. That's why I'm coming to you. Imagine with me that when you did something wrong and you went to that person, you knew 100% of the time they were to go, I forgive you. I love you. All good. I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. That's God. When we come with a repentant heart, and we're truly sorry for what we've done, and we want to repent that's turned from our old self to him, his hand is there. That's all he wants. He's, he wants a relationship with us. It's, that's it. He died on the cross for you because he wants a relationship with you. And so you, just think about it. It's not even imaginative. It's real that he, every time you go to him for forgiveness, He says yes. Every single time. If that doesn't give you chills and takes a weight off of your shoulders of the things you might be diving into now that you're going, no one's going to forgive me of this, including God. Look at David. David committed adultery. He lied to his kingdom. He lied to his God. And then he murdered somebody to cover it up. I would say that what you've done is probably junior varsity compared to what he did. And he forgave him. What does Paul say? I'm a chief of sinners. I've I've done so many things wrong. I killed Christians. Jesus forgave him. And he can forgive you too. See, when we think about the question, how big is your God? We have to have that understanding as well. God is so big that he will forgive you of your stuff. Let's look at this last passage. God in your mind. The Bible says that we ought to transform our thinking. In, In Romans 12, be renewed by the transforming of your thinking in your mind. Let's go to Job Job 40. You want to talk about someone who had problems? Read the book of Job. Just read the first two chapters. Brutal. Up to this point, as you guys are turning there, up to this point, Job has lost everything. Except his wife and his... And, and that's it. He actually he loses his children, his, his home, his cattle, his health. And I think it's, it's crazy that at one point, like, every, everyone dies and a servant runs to Job and says, hey, your, your children are dead, and then he dies. And I'm like, this man's got problems, because then right after that, he's got three friends that come to him and tell him how it's all his fault, that all these bad things are happening. You must have done this in order for God to do this. And then he finally gets another friend that comes in because Job is starting to believe it. And Elihu comes in, another friend, and he says, he rebukes the friends. He's like, get out of here. You're not speaking truth. And 
And then he looks at Job and he goes, why are you believing these guys? Why are you thinking this way? And then we get to this point and God shows up. God shows up. Shocking when you have problems and, you, and there's things going wrong in your life. God shows up. Let's start off in verse 6 in chapter 40. It says, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, imagine that. Just, I just want to stop. Imagine that. That you're like, you're going through problems. You've got friends that are just berating you. And then all of a sudden, this giant whirlwind is coming. And it's God. Like, whoa. Like, I would just be literally blown away. It would just be so cool. I would, I, you don't know what you would do. Like, and Job's sitting here. At the end of his rope, and God shows up in a whirlwind. It's so awesome. Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. This is when God starts throwing in the sarcastic rhetorical questions. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Have you an arm like God, and can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with Glory and splendor, pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and abase him. Look, look on everyone who is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them all in the dust together, bind their faces in the world below. Then will I also acknowledge to you that, you, that your own right hand can save you. If you can do all of these great things, if you can handle all of these great things and you can judge people and you can condemn God as we say, are you going to put me in the wrong? God's telling Job. Then, then and only then will I acknowledge that you can save yourself. Job had the wrong view of God at this point. He didn't. He wasn't magnifying God. He was belittling God. He was putting God in the wrong. David was not magnifying God. He was belittling God because to David, God couldn't handle his problems, so he had to handle it himself. Why do we fall into this trap? Because we're human. Because we will walk through this life with problems and sin. And we're human. And that's why I love at the end of that passage... In 2 Samuel 12, that says, your sin is far from you. It's pretty cool. Lastly, I, I thought of this song, and I actually, I, I said it at men's breakfast the other day. Um, I was down in, in my basement, or downstairs, and we really don't have a basement, it's in my daughter's rooms. We just bought them a bed, so we're putting together the bed. It's from Ikea, and if you don't want problems, don't buy things from Ikea. So is it, was, it was a doozy. So we, I'm putting together, and, and I finally got together. So they, Sarah and the girls got home. We're downstairs, and we're playing. They're playing on the bed. It's a bunk bed, so they get to go up to Top Top. That's what Naomi calls it, um, Top Top, and so we – we're putting them up there, and they're playing. And uh, then we get down down on the ground. We're rolling around and stuff. And Sarah likes to have music going on with the kids. She's she's phenomenal with them. And and she plays this song. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the song Cartoons by Chris Rice. Uh, if you haven't, it's a great kid song. It, it says, I was thinking the other day, what if cartoons got saved? They'd start singing praise. In a whole new way. And then it goes through different characters like Fred and Wilma Flintstone sing Yabba Yabba Doo Ya. Like, and it's really cool. And like Cow, Cowabunga Luya is the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And it does that. It's, it's just a fun song. But I, I knew that my wife was a big Chris Rice fan. And so I, I don't know about you if you've ever played music and you start to reminisce. And he's a 90s guy. So uh, I was like telling, I brought up on Amazon Music just the Chris Rice songs and I started playing them I was like do you know this song and she's like she starts singing it and I was like do you know this song and I just messing with her but then I was like what do you like put these songs with what memories and then I played this song that I'm going to play for you here in a second 
It's called Clumsy. I know, it's, it's such a good song. So I play this song, and I'm, and I'm laying there. And have you ever had that moment where you're, like, either reading the Word or you're listening to music or something like this, and, and like, God just goes, like, I want you to really hear this. That's what I felt like at that moment. So I'm listening to this song, and I'm quiet, and Sarah goes, are you okay? <laughs> like, and I'm just like, I think so. And so the next day, like, I couldn't get the song off my mind, so I listened to this song on the way to work, and... By the time I get to work, I'm bawling my eyes out. And wait till you hear the lyrics of this song. Because I know without a doubt, if someone pulled by and saw me in the car out, out in front of the church, they'd think, like, did, he, did his dog die? What's up? Like, uh, I, and so that's, I was just so distraught because how awesome this song is. If in your notes, on the back side of your notes, there's the lyrics to this song. And Go ahead and play that if you will. I think I'd have it down by now. Been practicing for 30 years. I should have walked a thousand miles. So what am I still doing here, yeah? Reaching out for that same old piece of forbidden fruit. I slip and fall and I knock my halo loose. Somebody tell me what's a boy supposed to do. I get so clumsy. I get so foolish. I get so stupid. And then I feel so useless. But you're saying you love me. And you're still gonna hold me That you wanna be near me Cause you're making me holy Still making me holy, yeah I'm gonna get it right this time I'll be strong and I'll make you proud Pray that prayer a thousand times The rooster crows and my tears roll down I can never, no, never be good enough And that you're not gonna let that come between us Cause I get so clumsy I get so foolish I get so stupid And then I feel so useless But you're saying you love me And you're still gonna hold me And that you wanna be near me Cause you're making So clumsy, and I get so foolish. I can get so stupid sometimes, and then I feel so useless. But you're saying you love me, and you're still gonna hold me. Glad you wanna be near me, cause you're making me whole. I get so clumsy, and I get so foolish. good, isn't it? We're going to mess up. We're going to have the wrong view of God as we live our lives. We're not going to realize how big He truly is because we're finite and He's not. He's omnipotent, omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's all-powerful, all-knowing. There's nothing in this world that He can't do. Don't fall into the trap that he's smaller than your problems. Don't fall into the trap that he's smaller than your sin. 
You can and He will forgive you. He will help you through your stuff. Because, because He's God and He loves you. So I don't know where you're at with, with those things. I don't know if you're going through problems. You have, maybe it's between you and your spouse. Maybe it's a work problem, finances. I don't know. I know that God will help you. I don't know if He'll make it easy for you. But I know with Him, it'll be easier. If without Him, you're fighting an uphill battle. And it's not worth it. Last thing, Dave Olson said this to me that I, it stuck with me. We, at Grace Group, we were having a conversation about this. because I like talking about this stuff with people, just reflecting, getting people's thoughts and everything. Um, people that are smarter than me. Um, and I, I, so I was talking to Dave Olson, and he said this. I thought it was, it was so good. He goes, sometimes we have to be forgiven of our deepest sin in order to truly understand how great of a God we serve. Let me repeat that. Sometimes you have to be forgiven of your greatest sin, your deepest, darkest sin, in order to realize how great of a God we truly serve. Because He's fantastic, and He wants a relationship with you, and He wants to help you. He's putting His hand down there, like He did to Peter, and He's saying, just let me bear your burdens. Lean on me and my understanding and my knowledge and my greatness and I'll help you through. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this is a question that we will struggle with our entire life. 